Agreed to. Mr. President. The Senator from California. Mr. President, I would, I would ask to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I have a number of topics to go over. I'm going to do it as briefly as I can, because I know colleagues uh, want to uh, put forward a unanimous uh, consent request. Uh, but in our work, uh, every day something happens, and I feel compelled to talk about a few of these things. But before I begin my remarks, I want to send a message of condolence to all those parents who've lost their children to violence in our country, in the Middle East, all over the world. Mr. President, children and all innocents must be protected in a truly civilized world. And we need to work toward that day. We have to pray for that day. But it's going to take people caring. Now, Mr. President, when somebody said you have to walk and chew gum at the same time when you're a senator, boy, they were, they were more than right. There's so many issues that are coming at us. And I want to go over just a few of them. And I'm going to start off uh, talking about the crisis that we face in the Highway Trust Fund. David, would you put up the first chart? And Mr. President, I want to call attention to a transportation government shutdown, which will happen in 25 days unless we reauthorize the Highway Trust Fund. And then in August, even before that, we have a slowdown in payments to the states. And it's very, very serious. Unless Congress takes action, billions of dollars in transportation funding to the states will be delayed or stopped. Now, I see Senator Corker here, and I know he's here on another topic, but I do want to thank him for his courage, working across the aisle to say, you know what, we need to pay for our roads. We need to pay for our bridges. And I see Senator Klobuchar on the floor. She knows what it means when a bridge collapses, for goodness sakes. And, and you have to be able to pay for certain things in this government. We could argue about frills around the edges, but I don't think anyone disagrees. If you went out on the street and asked whether or not the United States of America should have a grade A transportation system. Now, the DOT, the Department of Transportation, sent out letters to all of our states warning that the fund is in a dire situation and we have to act. And in 74 days, the trust fund goes completely bankrupt if we don't come up with the additional revenue. So here's where we are. In 74 days, we actually have to reauthorize the whole program. And then in 25 days, the payments slow. Now, why is this happening? It's because federal gas tax receipts that are paid into the trust fund have not kept pace with inflation or the rising costs of building our bridges and highways. Now, there are thousands of businesses and millions of jobs that are at risk if we do not act. And that's why we have so many people uh, supporting the reauthorization of the trust fund and figuring out a way to pay for that. We have the Chamber of Commerce, and they're aligned with the AFL-CIO. Now, this is a rarity. Usually, those groups are fighting each other. But we have unanimity here. U.S. Chamber, American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, Associated General Contractors, as I said, the AFL-CIO, the Associated Equipment Distributors, the National Stone, Sand, and Gravel Association, the Ready Mix Concrete Association, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the International Union of Operating Engineers. Mr. President, we have 70,000 bridges that are in disrepair. They're called deficient. We have 50% of our highways that are not up to par. What are we doing? I can tell you what we're not doing. We're not doing our job. Now, I can brag just for a minute. Senator Vitter and I were able to get a bill through unanimously through the Environment and Public Works Committee. Not one dissenting vote. And I got to say to my colleagues who are listening, that committee is an object in the diversity we bring here. We've got Bernie Sanders. We've got Jim Inhofe. We've got Barbara Boxer. We've got David Vitter. 
We have John Barrasso, we have Sheldon Whitehouse, we have Ben Cardin, and we have Senator Fisher. So we have a broad diversity. I haven't mentioned Senator Sessions. We have, and Senator Gillibrand, and Senator Booker. This is a committee that represents the ideological spectrum of the Senate. And I will tell you, we passed the bill out for six years. We know it has to be paid for, but we were very, very, uh, I think, reasonable in what we said. We said, look, this isn't the time for a giant new increase. We kept it at current levels of spending plus inflation. And God bless Senator Wyden and Hatch. They're working to come up with a plan to pay for this bill. And we have colleagues, as I mentioned, uh, Senators Murphy and Corker, who came together and said, look, the Chamber of Commerce makes a good point. We haven't raised the gas tax in a very long time. If we do a few cents a year, we'll be able to uh, patch up this trust fund, and more than patch it up, get it going for six years. So I would put my rest of my statement in the record, uh, Ms. President, if that's all right. Without objection. And I would say this. Um, the clock is ticking, however you look at it. Uh, one more time. The clock is ticking. It's 25 days till a slowdown of payments to the states. In 25 days, our states are going to be howling because they won't be able to pay for work that's already been done. The way it works is they do the work and then we repay them for, in many cases, 75% of the work, in some cases, 50% of the work. So I call on all my colleagues, let's just set politics aside. And uh, now I'm going to talk about, briefly, two other issues. And one of them has to do with the Supreme Court decision on birth control. You know, I hope every woman in America is paying attention to what this court did. Five men, all Republican appointees, basically saying a corporation can put its religion above all its employees. It's, it's just astounding. Having voted for the Religious Freedom Act, Restoration Act, I know why I voted for it. It was a very important piece of legislation. It said that individuals can't have their freedom of religion stepped upon. It didn't say corporations. So here you have a situation where one family doesn't believe in birth control, and now they're telling every woman who works there, sorry, you're out of luck. It's really unbelievable. And to me, the court siding with a corporation over the thousands of people who work at this is just shocking. What happened to individual freedom here? And I just have to say, we're going to try our best to fix it. But let's remember this. 99% of women have used birth control at some point in their lifetimes. Let me say that again. 99% of women have used birth control at some point in our lifetime. 1.5 million women take birth control solely for painful conditions. 60% of the women on birth control take it in part for painful and difficult conditions. So the Supreme Court, in an ideological, political decision, in my view, said to the women of America, you know, corporations are more important than you. And we're going to try to fix this. We're going to do everything we can. I hope we can reach across the aisle. I, I have hopes that we can to fix this. And now I'm going to conclude my remarks because the week that we were away, I was working in the state. I, I went to some highway projects. I, I went to a national park. But all through the time I was working in the state, I was hearing just a continuum of the blame game going toward our president. Republicans blame President Obama for every single thing that happens. Not enough jobs, they blame the president. Even though since his policies have been in place, we've had 52 straight months of job growth. Last month alone, 288,000 jobs created. Remember, at the end of George Bush's time here, we were bleeding 700,000 jobs a month. The unemployment rate, it has dropped from 10% to 6.1%. And we could be doing even better if Republicans hadn't blocked the President's jobs bills. 
The Obama recovery even includes a record-breaking stock market, which helps everybody. Everybody's got a 401k, a retirement account. When the president took office, the Dow Jones average was under 8,000. Now it's more than doubled, and the Dow hit 17,000 for the first time last week. But yet and still, oh, the president is to blame for not enough jobs. Deficits. Republicans blame the president, even though since he took office, the deficit's been cut by more than half. And deficits would be lower still if our friends on the other side stopped fighting with us when we try to close tax loopholes like ending the tax policy that rewards companies for shipping jobs overseas or passing more equitable income tax rules, which would allow people like Warren Buffett to pay the same effective tax rate as his secretary. Not a bad idea. Would really help us. We get rid of that deficit. Remember, when Bill Clinton was president, we wound up not only not having a deficit, we had a surplus. And when George W. came in, started a couple of wars, put them on the credit card, tax cuts to the rich, put that on the credit card, and we've been battling it ever since. Now we have an influx of immigrants from Central America. Republicans blame the president, even though it's House Republicans who are blocking immigration reform that the Senate already passed in a bipartisan way, which will greatly enhanced border protection, spends tens of billions of dollars on that, and sets out clear and fair rules for immigrants. And they blame President Obama, even though the guidelines for how we treat unaccompanied immigrant children from countries such as Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, those guidelines were set and signed by George W. Bush. Then we have the civil war in Iraq. Republicans blame President Obama even though he opposed the disastrous Iraq war. And I, can't, I have to say, uh, Senator Paul is not in that category. And I appreciate that. For the most part, Republicans blame President Obama, even though he opposed the disastrous Iraq war, which sowed the seeds for the sectarian warfare we're seeing today. How proud I was to vote with Senator, then Senator Biden, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, and along with 74 of my colleagues, we voted to say there ought to be a federation in Iraq, semi-autonomous regions, the Kurds, the Shias, the Sunnis. 74 of us voted for that, and the Bush administration laughed it off. Condi Rice, Dick Cheney, we have them all on record. And now this thing happens, and who gets the blame? The president gets the blame from the Republicans. How about Benghazi? You've heard about Benghazi. Republicans blame the president, and they continue to politicize this tragedy. Even though under President Obama's leadership, the US has captured the suspected terrorist who is believed to be one of the masterminds behind the killing of these four extremely brave Americans. Benghazi is a tragedy. It's not about a scandal. Now, how about the release of Sergeant Bergdahl? Republicans cried foul when the president really got him released, even though many of them, right in this chamber, and they're on videotape, calling for Sergeant Bergdahl's release. And they also have insisted that no soldier ever be left behind. I got to say, it just is getting old. Republicans blame the president for everything, including issuing executive orders. So I think, oh yes, the Speaker of the House is suing the president for abusing his executive power. Well, he averages, President Obama, the fewest executive orders per year of any president since Grover Cleveland. It's just getting to be too much. I wouldn't be surprised if the Republicans blamed President Obama for America's recent loss in the World Cup, or even for their own six consecutive losses in the annual congressional baseball game. Enough. We all need to work together. Stop the finger pointing. The people need us to work together, not to play the blame game. And I'm very hopeful that we'll have a little introspection around here. I know it might be a little too much to ask for, but I think if we did it, there's so many good people here on both sides of the aisle. 
And if we just decided for once and for all to put politics aside, the president won election twice. It wasn't even contested. So deal with it. Work with him. You know, I, I've served with five presidents, a couple of Republicans, several. I, I, I battled with them, you know, didn't agree with them. I remember Ronald Reagan, but there was one thing with Ronald Reagan that he would say, if, if we beat him in the Congress, he'd say, okay, let's move on. So yeah, sometimes Democrats win, sometimes Republicans win. We've got to move together and move forward and solve the problems of this great nation because the people expect it of us. I thank you very much. I yield the floor.